What's up, everybody? This is Brady Grove bringing you another interlude episode of Roto Bowler's official MMA podcast, Tap That. And with me today, she is a staple of the Adam Weight division. You might remember her from such promotions as King of the Cage, Combate Global, and Invicta. All hail the Queen of the North. Katie <laughs> Stahl is here. Katie, thanks so much for being here today. How's it going? Good. Thank you for having me. I appreciate your interest in my career and stuff. Thanks for having me on. Oh, I, I told you when we were talking on Twitter, I love the Adam Weight division. And, you know, the promotions you've been in, it, it's a tough sell always, you know, especially Invicta. Because with Invicta, some people, we just don't know how good they are yet, even. At, yeah. I have a level. I mean, take a split decision loss to Elise Anderson as an example, you know, and, and she right. has fought really well since then. Um, but real quick, let, let's start with this. Um, if you could explain to folks right now what your current connection to this season of The Ultimate Fighter is. <laughs> yeah, no, my... Uh boyfriend partner of I think eight years this year is uh filming his had just finished filming his second stint on the ultimate fighter uh Connor versus Chandler so it's very exciting that is exciting I mean like one the the coaches that it's gonna be it's a high profile season and the theme that they went for is very interesting too yes then, then you take into account how angry people were when Brad Katona was cut from the UFC after two long <laughs> I it's it's an internet. The first thing I said, I told a friend of mine about that, and I was like, "Yeah, oh. I, I was like, dude, I was like, Brad Katona got caught, at, got cut after a loss to Marab, and then one, I know that was it. What? Yeah, he uh he had fought Hunter Azure. I think that's how you pronounce it. And and you know we didn't you know, after that, and he took a, like a decision loss. And I don't know if you watch it back, like he didn't lose the fight. So we were pretty sure like, look, the UFC is going to understand and, you know, he gets another crack, but he didn't. And that happens. Uh, we've seen it with other people. So we're really happy to see him be able to fight on a platform he deserves. He grinded his way to a world title while he was outside of the UFC. And he did a lot more than the rest of the cast did to get where he is today. So I'm very excited for people to see the show and you know see what kind of resilience he has oh uh, yeah and it, you know he won a a high quality uh belt you know uh, right after getting yeah. the UFC and so you know I know a lot of people are excited to watch Brad Katona on this season the ultimate fighter I certainly am but Katie we're here to talk about you <laughs> that's okay and I get it so let, let's talk about the last fight. Uh, it yeah. was a big day FC 51. It was a unanimous decision loss for Ando Santos. I watched it again today. And oh. it's a competitive fight. You know, the, yeah. uh, you know there, was, there was some mixed scoring. It was a competitive matchup. It seems like over the last few fights, you've looked a lot more comfortable on your feet and in those kickboxing exchanges. So wh what was your take from the last fight? And, you know, how did you feel you did? What, what did you want to come out improving on afterward? Yeah, um, good question. I, it was a competitive fight. It was sort of a first round. Oh, okay. I see what I see it. It's a bit of optics here. I mean, I definitely think, you know, a certain way about that, but then you go into the second round and I watched the fight a second time after I got a bit of recovery and I was like, Oh my gosh, I was taking the second round. That's pretty exciting. So um, they were tight exchanges, but I was starting to make the necessary adjustments. And then, you know, certain things happen in fights and whoopsie daisies and things like that. And she took it, uh, she pounced on opportunity like she should and she's she's a good fighter so I was a big step up in competition and now that she's fighting for the belt I know where I stand and I'd like to fight her again because I think we both know we're on the same level so yeah I, so you, you brought up the point about optics and yeah that, that is kind of the impression that I, I got from watching like the last few of your fight is that these are such competitive fights, but like there's something about the optics that is, is unfairly, I feel like influencing how the scorecards come out sometimes. It can be. And and then it's going to be up to me instead of kind of feeling that way all the time. It was up to me to get more aggressive. And I felt like I was kind of doing that with uh, Hayani there, but 
you know, the first round was just, it was just too close. And because she was taking a step forward and maybe there was a bit more of a uh, biting down on the mouthpiece. It just looked a certain way. And so what I did in the second round was the same thing I did in my fight in July. I said, okay, let's close that range. Let's, let's, let's make her miss with inches, not miles, and then take a leg kick. So let's, let's close that range. And it was working again. So I'm very proud of that. Am I okay with losing? No, but I'm very proud of those adjustments because if certain things didn't happen in that fight, I think I was getting let into it. And I think she was letting me through the door there. So, you know, inches. So hopefully one day we throw it, we roll it back. It really does. I mean, you, you look back at your last four losses, unanimous decision loss and what Ugh. we talked about as a competitive fight, split decision to Marissa Balenciaga. Oh. Split decision, Elise Anderson, and unanimous decision, Alexander Toncheva. That indicates that there's a, a small, you know, there's a yeah. small margin that you got to get past. And these are all tough fights. Yeah, they are. And I, I just think there's just, we had made some adjustments in the um, the ones after that with the, the combate fight. And we took that one and we didn't make enough adjustments with this last one. I, I was excited that I was being put in with her because it was clear that I was going to be one of the few considered for the next title fight. And so I, I took the chance and, and I fell short, but it's just inches. And I, I it's up to me to make those changes now. And I, I have been trying, but it's not quick enough. So it's very shortly because Brad is back now. We took a small reset because that was a bit stressful for me with him away. And we're going to get back to work and, I think it's going to be small changes that get me there really small, but they need to happen now. Absolutely. And you know, that's the crazy thing about Invicta and especially in the, the, the Adam weight class is that you're, you're only a few good performances away yeah. from in that opportunity. And yeah. you know, that, so that's one thing, you know, you're, you're 35 years old. And in a lot of other sports, that's considered to be, you know, that there's not a lot of improvement left to happen. But we see like a such strong examples to the exact contrary every day in mixed martial arts. Is oh, yeah. There's people entering this sport late. There's people hanging around later than way later than they used to. And so yeah. you know, at this point, you know, what are your goals remain in the sport? And what do you think that you're going to be able to improve upon the most? I think um, what I'm going to be able to prove upon the most is just um, quite frankly, just letting it all hang out, like letting it go, mm -hmm. being just like quicker on the trigger with my entries. Just let your hands go. When you go first, nobody really has an answer for me. So it's just less hesitation. Let it all out there. I mean, the champ's 38, probably turning 39. I, I don't really care about what people have to say about the age. The only thing that I can control is how I feel about it. And I'm just going to keep getting to that Adam weight title fight in Invicta. I want to get the belt. I want to defend it. Yeah. Everybody wants to go to the UFC, but if, if that happens after I retire, there's nothing I can do about that, but I'll be ready if I'm still around and it's time. And so it's the Invicta belt and defending it. And I'm not stopping till I get there. Right. And so with your professional career starting back in 2017, and my God, some of the other names that you, you had to fight early in your career, Lindsay Van Zandt being, the, being one of them, what is that, six years ago now? I, I know. It's such a small community at the at those higher levels for yeah. especially the atom weight class. Um, yeah. With, with your pro career starting six years ago, and, you know, you were so quickly in promotions like KOTC and then Invicta followed a couple years later. You know, what's it, even when you have a, elite training partners and, a, you know, great people you train with, a great gym, great coaches, what is it like, you know, starting off at a level that already garners, you know, respect and the opportunity that, you know, where if you win and you have good results, you're going to get a shot? It's really cool. Um, don't get me wrong. Sometimes it's... <laughs> I thought I'm a really honest person. It can be tough to see people rack up so many wins and have a great record. And you're just like, oh, mother, <laughs> because you're like fighting on a high level. And I, I have a couple of vets on the team that I'm not calling myself necessarily a vet, but vet, vets on the team who would probably be able to, they know that feeling. And so 
if it's not like I'm fighting anyone anywhere, anytime type of person, but I knew with my lack of amateur MMA and opportunity where I came from, I had to take those chances and it's paid off because Shannon and I have a great relationship. She believes in me and, and I'm going to be around for a while. So it's really cool knowing the level you're at. It's just don't, sometimes you're like, God damn it. I wish I had a better record. <laughs> Well, that's the thing is that what people don't understand about Invicta is that Invicta yeah. like is a different character of roster. Um, and yes. it, so people like look at your record and and disregard you know whatever's coming forward. But like those people are just straight up wrong, and they don't know how. Invicta yeah, works. they are. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and. It, you know, this is another thing you uh, you mentioned that you know if that if if Adam Wake comes to the UFC at a different time, can we just talk about for a second all the what could have beens of UFC mm. straw weights that, that did? And Michelle Waterson comes to mind immediately. Is like yeah, she's been a world champion at Adam Wake for a long time, and to me, especially in like this this era where there's more platforms than ever for athletes of all sorts to get their brand out. It just seems like a crazy thing that they don't think Adam weight is a promotable division. You know, yeah, it's hard to say, like if, if that's part of it, then there's like, then it feels like you just kind of throw your hands up and say, I don't know then, but I know I saw a tweet from Jill DeCorsi about like not having access to the best ones. And, if she's talking about one championships, I don't know half that roster can't make 105 on the scale, so it's a different atom weight division. So I'm not 100 percent sure if that's true. She she might know more than I do, but I'm like well, I don't know. They're pretty big, and they're you know I I doubt it. There'd be few that would definitely, but not a lot of them. So I don't know if it's an access thing. I don't see why it wouldn't happen eventually. I know Laura Sanko was advocating for it and I actually know her quite well. And I was like, you know, you, you make a lot of shit happen. Maybe mention it again because like you have some pull. So we'll see. We'll see. And it, it, it's just crazy because you think about how many untapped, you know, talent pools are out there that, you know, at the same talent pool that they thought wasn't there when they started the men's uh -huh. division at the UFC. Right. There's, you know, there's a whole continent you know, o over in the East that, you know, is at least r routinely producing fighters of these weight classes. I know, I know. And like, you know, you always make the joke like, ah, oh, poor men's flyweight, just because it's not bantam weight or it's not lightweight. <laughs> but they're around, they're keeping it. Now it's getting more and more exciting, actually, of your your guys you like, like Kai Care friends and stuff. And it's, 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 it's growing into its own thing all over again. And I just think if you gave the, the little ones a chance, you'd be surprised because... Like, if you looked at my fight, for example, with Hayani, I, I had a lot of, like, nice compliments after that. Like, I, when I fought Marissa, you know, there was a big uproar, at least on my team side, that we didn't think I lost. But I got less compliments about that than I did this one I lost. So people were impressed with the level the Adam Waits brought. And, and we bring the fire. So, and there's some real, real talented Brazilians coming in. So... I just think it would be worth it if they took a shot on us, but. And, you know, definitely with the, the spread and availability of sports betting now, you know, th yeah. throughout the United States and everywhere else, um, you know, I think Invicta is catching a lot more people's attention than it did in the past. Cause now there's interest in betting on it. Right. And like Shannon, so like now that it's like on certain fight networks and it's you know i just feel like because women's mma keeps growing rapidly and how there's all these atom weights coming out of nowhere and pe some women dropping to atom weight now it's like growing and growing and i'm like oh it's gonna happen soon so i just want to be around for it but quite frankly my focus is on the invicta belt and that's where you can you know that's what i'll hone in on right now and you know, for folks that may not know, uh, could you give a little background into, you know, what your background is and why you got into the sport at the time that you did? Yeah, I uh, I was like in high school, your typical like hanging out with friends, partying and things. And I did some boxer size for fitness and it was really like one of these two to three time a week things. But around 19, it was a late start. I I insisted on being competitive in it just to see how I did. And it was a rough start. Like I thought up a couple a little bit of weight and didn't do the best but I, I got hooked and so I ended up I think I ended up with 40 boxing fights and I even fought for the national team so that was where I started and 
I kind of fell out of love with it when certain things, you know, decisions, close calls, stuff like that. And then I, I fought on a high level and I just couldn't bring the fire. I had started jujitsu and I was like, I think I want to do MMA. So it all kind of transitioned and I didn't even start MMA till my twenties, early twenties. So it was, it was a late start, but that happens with so many people. So. And so how would you describe the difference between trying to make your way up in mixed martial arts as opposed to boxing? I think boxing might have been tough. Uh, there was actually a, a national champ. I was like second in the country for a couple of years. The one who was number one is now, I think she's 15 and one as a pro. Like she's got it made in boxing. She did a really good job with uh, her promotion or marketing. And I think she was a bit of a diamond in the rough because it is hard to find the right way to build your record in women's boxing and get paid right. And she, she did it right because she's from Montreal. And it's a hot fight town, but I think it would have been really hard to make it work. I think opportunities would have been probably the hardest thing to find. And MA, it's like very, it's all over the place now. So no, for sure. And you know, for what would you say, you know, is is your favorite thing about currently being under the Invicta banner? And you know, what do you think, besides the fact that it's an all-female MMA promotion, what do you think sets it apart? Um, as opposed to, you know, some of the other top MMA promotions in the world? Um, what sets it apart is probably Shannon Knapp and her staff, her trusted staff, like Julie Kedzie and Angela Lindland and some special people there because what what they do is they they have what the budget they have and they spend every cent they have on keeping the fighter's interest at the top of their minds. So they make sure all the women get their hair braided. They make sure they get paid well. They make sure they have their hotels. They, they make sure the commission isn't out of control for medicals. They're, they're just all about keeping you comfortable, making you feel welcome and just part of this special thing. And I, I talk to Shannon via WhatsApp, like every week and a half, two weeks, it's like an open door policy. It's just, I feel special being a part of it. So and love Julie Kedzie. Uh, yeah, I know. Love her from her days for sure. Oh yeah, she she gets it. <laughs> uh, so Katie, your your most recent fight was um, back in January of this year. Uh, currently, don't have anything on topology for what's next. So you know what what are you thinking next? Do you have any sort of timetable you're trying to hit moving forward? What what what's the plan for the next year? Yeah, um, Brad. John and I, like Brad is a big hand in my career as well. He he travels overseas with me for the most part as John is pulled in many directions, but he's also in the gym in Ireland more often than he, he was before during COVID. So we get all this coaching attention, but for the most part, Brad corners me. So what we wanted was a quick turnaround, but May 3rd was going to be the goal until Brad went to the house. I was on my own there. I had a small injury. There was a few hiccups and Shannon was going to keep me in mind for this May third title fight card with my last opponent and the and Jillian, but I haven't heard from her yet. And it's about five weeks away. I don't love just throwing myself in there carelessly, but I will be fairly close to wait if something falls through where they need me. But it's probable that I'll get on the following card, and I hope that's July. I would search elsewhere, but Invicta is where I want to be, and I know I want to climb that ladder. So. May 3rd, I'll be ready if something comes up, but I think it'll probably be the following card. Now, I, I think that you're spot on there. I think, you know, if you're talking, you know, hopefully July, um, mm -hmm. you, know, it, you know, that is, that seems like a perfect amount of time to, yeah. you know, wait and see as opposed to, you know, trying to fit in another fight and, you know, yeah, rush. things happen and you know if something doesn't go your way in that one then you're you're not nearly in the position with Invicta that you wanted to be no I'm I'm sort of SOL at that stage you don't want to be you know the only problem with a record is is somewhat how it looks on paper too I mean Shannon and I again I know she believes in me and stuff but we don't want to be falling down the ladder there because we rushed so I want to make sure that I get this it's a small injury but that injury kind of figured and we get myself in optimal shape for the next one. And we know it's going to be another hard fight because that's what we do. And we'd be, we'd be ready to fire in July, which is probably, I hope, the, uh, the 
the timeline for their following one. And Katie, I can already feel it. The 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 optics of the record and it, the fact that you seem to get slept on, like for some reason, <laughs> more than other fighters. I I can already feel that you're going to be a mild to moderate underdog going into whatever fight, and that yeah. that's the smart <laughs> money is on Kate for for how close oh. the results have been. And how, I mean, and the level of competition, it's, yeah. you know, it's, there's, it's by such a small difference. You can tell yeah. going back Thank a you. handful of years, um, yeah. but Katie, that's, that's all I had for you today. Thank if, you. If you have anything you want to say, anybody you want to shout out, anything at all, the floor is yours. Oh, thanks. Um, I want to give a big congratulations to my teammate, Danny Nealon, on winning the strawweight title a couple of weeks ago. That was inspirational. Um, I think it was like Nate Landauer that said, I don't negotiate with pain or fatigue. And that's what she, she did. She did not negotiate and she's done nothing but inspire me for my next one. I want to bring a little more Danny to my next fight. So I'm proud of her. Thank you, John Kavanaugh, for all you con continually do. And check out my, my special an amazing and outstanding boyfriend um, on The Ultimate Fighter, May 30th on ESPN. Folks, this has been another interlude episode of Roto Bowler's official MMA podcast. Tap that. All hail Katie Saul, the queen <laughs> of the north. Uh, Katie, thank you. thank you so much for being here today. I'm so glad we got to do this. Me too. Thank, thank you. So you. And folks, thanks for listening. Peace. Bye. Thanks, guys.